again from all of us here at Earth for Energy. Our topic today is going to be photovoltaic system design and sizing. This will be an in-depth discussion on photovoltaic or PV system design, the sizing of your system, and the considerations as they relate to efficient use of energy. We're then going to enter our information into the Earth for Energy solar calculator so you can see exactly how much energy needs to be produced from a PV system for the average household. One of the topics we want to cover today is factors affecting PV design cost. The first consideration is that we should ensure that the current energy usage is maximized for efficiency. Next, we should exercise care in determining what devices and loads will be powered by the PV system. Lastly, we should replace or consider replacing all energy inefficient devices. For example, older model refrigerators that aren't as efficient as they once were, or may have a leaking seal around the door, or incandescent light bulbs that we'll discuss in depth shortly. Loads impose the single greatest influence on the size and the cost of any PV system. We can minimize our PV system cost by efficiently using the energy we have available to us. It's a lot less expensive to reduce power consumption than it is to build a PV system to supply the power for all the devices that we're currently using. Many common households use electric resistance to operate. Those types of devices would be the electric ovens, water heaters, space heaters or electric clothes dryers, all of which fall under the category of resistive heating. Space heating and water heating may be better accomplished by using solar thermal heating, propane, natural gas or wood. When you're able to supply thermal loads from thermal sources, that's an example of load shifting, a more efficient use of energy. In talking about these resistive loads, it's important to mention that if we attempt to power these resistive loads with our PV system, we're probably going to find that it's going to be cost prohibitive to build the system large enough to provide for all these devices. However, we do have other resistive loads within the household, like the toaster and hair dryer, and they do consume a lot of power or watts. Yet, because we only use them for a short time, their consumption is relatively low, and they can in fact be used or powered by the PV system. Another consideration would be surge loads. What that means is that when you have a device with a motor and that motor is turned on after a period of rest, it can draw anything between three to seven amounts of power that it normally does under normal continual operation. So we have to consider these needs into our system. We need to make a list and check it twice on how to save energy. The planning stage will save us a lot of time and frustration down the track, so it's a good idea to identify the items we want to power with our PV panels and those we do not. As we consider the design and size of our PV system, we certainly need to discuss electric load requirements. You can take any device, look at the nameplate on it, and it'll tell you either how many amps it draws or perhaps it'll show wattage. If it tells you the amps, then you multiply the amps by the voltage, which in most households is 120 volts, so it would equate to the amount of watts that it's using. In this example, let's assume that you have a device plugged into the wall that's currently drawing 2 amps. 2 amps times 120 volts equals 240 watts. Please note, some countries like Australia or the United Kingdom use 240 volts, so please use 240 when doing calculations. Another item to consider would be duty cycles, and this is the amount or percent of time that device plugged into the wall is actually drawing power. And the first thing that comes to mind is your refrigerator or your freezer. Though they're plugged into the wall all the time, they may draw power only when the compressor is running, which is 50 to 60 percent of the time. Another item to bring to your attention would be the phantom loads. These loads draw power constantly. In the modern household, there are numerous examples of items that are considered phantom loads, and what's really interesting is that some of these loads actually draw more power when they're off than when they're actually running. That's right, I said when they're off. Some examples are appliances with digital clocks, your instant-on TVs, VCRs, battery chargers. You don't think about it, but if it's plugged in and charging all the time, it's always drawing something. These loads may seem insignificant, but they use power 24-7. One of the ways you can combat energy leakage that these devices cause is you could consider unplugging them, or you can place them on a timer or a switch circuit. Here's an example of the impact that the phantom loads have on your electric bill. Here, I've listed several items that are common in a modern household, and you may or may not have all of these, but if you look, they all draw some amount of power each hour, day, and month. These items are just sitting around doing nothing, but when you add them all up, they're costing you about $60 per year to run. And these are only a few items. 
If you were to look around your household and see a light, clock, or anything that has a remote control and is waiting for you to turn it on or off, you can be sure that they are drawing power. It may be out of sight and out of mind, but you're paying for it. Also, again, I want to repeat that it's a lot less expensive to reduce your power consumption than to attempt to build a PV system large enough to accommodate for these devices that you may be currently using. So it's very important we go over the ways to reduce your energy usage as it can save you quite a lot of money off your PV system's initial cost. The next topic I want to discuss is your refrigeration. You may not know it, but the refrigerator is one of the single largest energy loads in a residential home. Therefore, whenever you're thinking about getting a newer, more efficient one, there are some specifications you need to consider. Number one is that it needs to have superior insulation with a very high R value. And when you look at them, if it doesn't say on the item, you need to ask the salesperson what the R value of that particular refrigerator is. Number two is that you should look for a refrigerator that has a small current draw when operating. Additionally, it should have separate compartments for the freezer and the refrigerator. You also want to look for an efficient compressor waste heat removal. What that means is that whenever that compressor is running, it absorbs the heat out of the refrigerator compartment and that heat has to go somewhere. Consequently, you want to make sure that the compressor is as efficient as possible, which means that you definitely want to keep your coils free from lints and dust so that the system can work efficiently as possible. In addition, you should avoid side-by-side -side models. And lastly, and this is a common notation, look for a refrigerator that is Energy Star rated. While we're on the subject of refrigeration, just a couple more thoughts. In a standalone PV system, that's one that's off the grid, it's imperative that you have a high energy efficient refrigerator. Now there are four basic models of refrigerators available for off the grid systems. Propane, kerosene, AC, and DC powered. The propane powered refrigerators, believe it or not, have been in use for over 70 years and they're used in RVs all the time. One of the drawbacks of a propane model or a kerosene model is that they both need to be refueled. They don't need electricity, but they do need refueling. Therefore, if you're going to be using them, you definitely want to have a supply of fuel to keep them working. Next, the standard AC power refrigerator. As we discussed previously, if you use an AC powered refrigerator on a PV system that's off the grid, you must have an inverter to convert your DC power to AC power to operate your refrigerator. Lastly, what would be a common type of refrigerator on an off-the-grid system is a DC-powered refrigerator, which could be 12, 24, or 48 volts. Frankly, these do have a higher cost initially, but they do run directly off a battery or off the PV system if there's no inverter required. The next topic that I want to discuss with you is lighting consideration. There are three offerings when we talk about lamps. The first one, and probably the most popular, is the incandescent. This is the one that Edison made and it has the filament inside. We've all grown up with them and they're the most commonly used today, even though, unbelievable as it sounds, they have the poorest efficiency or lowest lumens, which is the amount of light per watt ratings. The reason that they're so widespread in usage is probably because they have a low initial cost, attractive color, and they're easy to install. However, in the last several years, the incandescent light has found competition from the compact fluorescent light, which is in the marketplace, called CFL lighting. These have superior efficiency and longevity compared to the incandescent lights. As you'll see in a moment, they consume about one quarter the amount of power that an incandescent light does. Lastly, I just want to mention the light-emitting diodes, or LEDs. You can see these in traffic lights, car brake lights, and flashlights. They're harsh on the eyes, and over time, they are hard to take. But the use of the LEDs will increase as time goes by, and as they're improved, to be usable in a more extended period. The LEDs are even more power efficient than the CFLs, but the reason that they've not found widespread acceptance is because the light is almost too harsh for people to use long term. Here's a comparison of a Philips 60 watt soft light bulb and an Envision 14 watt day light bulb. As you can see, the Envision, which is a CFL or compact fluorescent light, utilizes about 77% less energy than a standard Philips 60 watt light bulb. Furthermore, as you can see, the lifespan of the CFL bulb is 10 times the lifespan of the standard one. That's why you'll find the CFLs in more and more usage in the modern home today. Here's another comparison. As you can see here, Table 1 compares the wattage of the commonly available incandescent lights with the wattage of the CFLs and what they'll provide at similar levels. 
you can see that almost without exception, the actual power usage of the incandescent bulb is about four times of the CFL bulb. Therefore, this is certainly an area in which you may want to give consideration prior to setting up a PV system. When you consider supplying power to operate the devices or appliances in your house, the CFL light bulb could make a substantial difference throughout your household and energy savings. This last chart shows you how much you can save by using CFL bulbs in your home. You can see just how much it costs you to have a 100-watt incandescent bulb opposed to a 27-watt CFL bulb. The savings over a lamp life utilizing a CFL is considerable compared to that of an incandescent. Now, using this table, calculate how much you would save if you were to replace all the incandescent light bulbs in your household with the CFLs. Not only would you immediately see a reduction in energy usage, but you'd also see a reduction in your electricity bill, and not only for that month, but also for every month after. The next items we want to discuss are factors that influence load estimates. Load estimations would be difficult to calculate for several reasons. First, we need to be sure to use correct load estimates. Always use the manufacturer's literature or the faceplate whenever possible. Do not guess. If you want to know how much that toaster is going to use in wattage, take the device, turn it upside down, and look at the faceplate. It's either going to tell you the watts or the amps, and since you know the voltage, you use the formula that we know. Watts is equal to volts times amps. This way you can figure out what the load that device is going to use. Another thing we want to take into consideration are duty cycles. If you recall previously, we talked about items like the refrigerator or the freezer, which are plugged in all the time, but they're not always drawing power. So we want to take that into consideration. If a refrigerator is plugged in 24 hours a day, but it's actually only running, let's say, 6 hours a day, that would be a 25% duty cycle. This would affect our calculations. In addition, we need to consider all energy conservation, equipment efficiency, and load shifting possibilities. I know that not everyone is able to do the load shifting, but it would be careless of me if I didn't encourage you to constantly be thinking about how to reduce your energy consumption. Another item is future loads, which may vary because our needs change. Equipment becomes old and less efficient. Loads are operated when not needed. Have you ever gone to work and because you were in a hurry you found the light in your ceiling fan on when you came back? Well, guess what? You paid for the light in the ceiling fan the whole time you were at work. Now, it may not be a lot for one day, but can you imagine if you did that 30 days a month or 365 days a year? It can add up to a lot of energy wasted and money out of your pocket. Furthermore, whenever we're calculating, we're going to come up with a number that we think is sufficient to accommodate our household. We should also factor in the growth factor. I don't know whether you want to allow 10, 15, or 20% growth factor because maybe your family's going to grow or things are going to change, so you might want to be mindful of whatever additional loads might be added to the system in the future. Since we're on the topic of load calculations, we've included here a few common household items and the typical wattage requirements for each. I want to stress that these are estimates. They're fairly accurate, but they're still estimates only. And I want to repeat and emphasize what we said previously, which is that we always want to use the manufacturer's literature. Having said all that, here you can see some general household items like a ceiling fan, a clock radio, a TV, power saw, a few kitchen appliances. This is not an all-inclusive list, but hopefully this will help you think about the items that you have in your kitchen or about the kind of entertainment equipment you have. What you certainly want to think about is the refrigeration topic. How old is your refrigerator? I'm not suggesting that you buy a new one, but I am suggesting that you think about what condition it's in and how efficient it is in using the energy that it's consuming. Up to now, we've been talking about how to calculate our loads, and we had memory joggers of what kind of items we'll want to be calculating. Now we're going to enter this information into our solar calculator. It's a good idea to use the Earth for Energy solar calculator because you can see everything that uses power in your home, and you can even print it out for later reference. So here we have the Earth for Energy Solar Calculator. You can access this calculator from the Earth for Energy Members page. This is just going to be a demonstration on how we use this calculator to determine the size of the PV system we would need to build. In the top part of the calculator, we'll enter the appliances we want to power from the PV system. First we have the lights. I'll say 6 20-watt CFL bulbs at 4 hours per day. Next is a TV. 60 watts at 3 hours per day. DVD player, 40 watts used for one hour per day, which equals seven hours per week, which is enough for a few movies every week. 
Then we have the laptop computer, 50 watts used for two hours per day. A toaster uses about 900 watts, but it's not used for long. If I enter 0.1, this means the toaster is used for six minutes per day. Same goes with a vacuum cleaner. This is about 1500 watts, but only used about 12 minutes per day or 24 minutes every two days. So I'll enter 0.2 for the vacuum cleaner. Lastly, I'll enter the refrigerator. This can be an average 500 watt unit and only draws constant power for about five hours per day. Now I'll calculate that and you can see the total daily and monthly watt hours each appliance uses. At the bottom, you'll see the total for all of the appliances. Now let's say we make seven panels at 75 watts each. This comes to a total of 525 watts from the array of panels. Let's enter six hours per day of sunlight on the solar array, meaning the solar panels are in full sun for approximately six hours per day. I'll press calculate and you can see the total daily watt hours from the PV system is 3,000 and monthly watt hours is 90,000 or 90 kilowatt hours. Just under this, you can see what percentage of your total power usage will be powered with the seven panels. The next part of the calculator will show you the size of the battery bank you would need for your appliances. The daily watt hours will automatically be entered after you fill out the top form. In this case, we use 3,690 daily watts. Please note, when calculating your battery bank size, the calculator will take into consideration that the battery should not be fully discharged. Our calculator's results will retain 35% of the battery's charge for durability, as this is the maximum the battery should be discharged. Okay, let's say you didn't have a laptop. Just click on the red Remove button at the end and it'll subtract it from the list. Press Calculate again and you'll see different results. Now let's say you only used three 20 watt light bulbs per four hours per day each instead of six. Change the value and press Calculate. Now the seven solar panels will power over 94% of the home. You can play around with this calculator for a while to work out the size of the system you would need for your home. Once you've entered everything you need, you can print out the results by pressing this print button at the bottom or if you want to start all over again, press Clear All. So let's briefly recap what we've talked about today. There are several things we discussed. One of them was the features that affect PV system sizing and design. Then we talked about using energy efficiently. We talked about loads, the items that are going to be utilizing the electricity that pose the greatest impact on system design. We talked about resistive loads and their impact on system design. If you recall, the resistive loads are items like your water heater, clothes dryer, and these have very high load demand on your system. However, you're probably not going to build a system that's going to operate like that. We talked about load requirements. As you recall, we're using the basic formula, which is watts are equal to volts times amps. And you're going to see this formula repeatedly because it's critical to our understanding of a PV system. We discussed duty cycles. The duty cycles being how much energy a device actually draws, and even though it's plugged in all the time, how many hours of the day or a week it actually takes power. Then we talked about phantom loads, which personally I find very interesting because they have such an impact on not only your PV system, but every day in your home. You're probably wasting power right now without even knowing it. We talked about refrigeration and its impact because there's hardly a house that doesn't have a refrigerator. Having a good, efficient refrigerator and the seal around the door, a good contact and the coils not being dirty affects the operation and efficient use of electricity. We talked about lighting consideration. We did some comparisons between the incandescent light bulb we've all seen and the alternative, which is the compact fluorescent light bulb. We talked about the tremendous benefit of utilizing the CFL bulbs as opposed to the incandescent. Then we had some power usage estimates for a few common household appliances. Then I showed you how to use the Earth for Energy Solar Calculator to work out how much power your household is using, what size PV system you'd need to combat this power usage, and finally, the size of battery bank you'd need if you wanted to go off-grid. And just an FYI, this calculator can also be used to determine how much power a wind turbine will produce. Enter the average output of the wind turbine and the average hours per day producing this power. For example, a wind turbine producing 300 watts for five hours a day will produce 1,500 daily watt hours. 
Well, we've come to the end of this video about PV system design and sizing and the efficient use of energy. I hope you found this video interesting, and all of us at Earth for Energy would like to thank you for joining the renewable energy movement.